rushing wind blow through this temple. We're talking again uh, this morning about the marks of a spirit-filled believer. And uh, uh, today we're gonna, going to have an abbreviated time um, in the Word where we're going to concentrate just on the on the textual linguistic aspects of, of what we're looking at this morning. Now why is it worth spending as much time as we've spent on this so far and how much time we'll end up spending on this um, next week. Uh, it is important enough mainly because uh, this doctrine that we have been talking about uh, is basically the divide in a, in a period of I would say uh, darkness and, and poverty in the church. Uh, when the church lost track of what we had been talking about uh, relatively early in things, at least by, by 250 AD, uh, from that time until 1900, um, the experiences that we're talking about, the reality that, that we're talking about, and, and just the things that Scripture has said about these things had been lost to the church. It was just not part of their understanding. It was not part of their practice. And what happened to the church in that period of time? Well, if you're familiar with that history at all, nothing good. Right? Nothing good. That was the period of time that the church went dark in the spirit. It was the period of time that the church became at best nominal. In other words, giving lip service to their faith and to their acknowledgement of Christ and to the Word of God but not actually practicing it, not actually doing the things that were in the Word of God, not actually living a life that was described by the Word of God. And I would say that that's true despite the fact that we had the Reformation in the 1500s, which was a band-aid at best to the problems that the church was experiencing in the Holy Spirit up to that point in time. And I would say that even includes such things as the First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, um, and even, I would say, the prayer meeting revivals that were uh, uh, preceded immediately the Civil War, at least in this country, um, all of those things did not restore to the church biblical life. And when I say biblical life, I mean a life that experiences the things that are described in the Scripture. I think that's an important thing. How in the, ba how in the world do we have any basis to say to the world, we know something about what God wants to do in your life. We know something about how real God wants you uh, wants to be in your life. If the life that we live doesn't even agree with the testimony of what's in the Scripture, and simply said, it, it can't. And that's why, from let's say 250 A.D. roughly until 1900 roughly, the church was not the testimony of biblical life and the church was not the testimony of the promise of Christ. They were the testimony of something that was half empty instead of being full. They were the testimony of something that was was bleak when it came to the practice and the experience of the Holy Spirit rather than being something that was overflowing and, and something that was enthusiastic. And then along came the Pentecostal awakening and things began to change. And so is this doctrine that we've been talking about important? I would say it's, it's certainly his, uh, important from a historical standpoint. And I would say for each and every one of us personally, it's also important, particularly if it is our ambition in faith to live a life that is in agreement with the Word of God. Now, I know that's certainly true for me personally, and I trust it's true for all of you personally as well. I don't want a life that is me making it up according to my own dictates or according to my own preferences. I don't want a life that is left up to me to kind of make it up as I go. I want a life that is the life that Jesus spoke to the apostles about, that he promised to the apostles, and that they were able to enter into and pass along to us. I want that life. I want a life that matches that description. I want a life that agrees with that. I, I don't want the empty life of the churchy people that were existing for centuries on end without really having anything to show for it spiritually. Amen? Amen.
So what we're talking about in these last couple of weeks and what we're talking about today is, is, is an important doctrine. Now in the Assemblies of God, we call this doctrine our distinctive testimony. And when we say it's our distinctive te testimony, what we say is this is the one thing that, that we were willing to stand out apart as. Why did we need to have an Assemblies of God or why did we ha have to have a, a movement or a denomination, we could call it, that was trying to preserve the fruit of the Pentecostal revival? Well, we needed it because we didn't want believers to fall back into the darkness of practice that had existed before. Now, I've got to tell you, there are folks, well-learned folks, and folks that have fantastic reputations who don't understand the things that I've been talking about, that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. And I hope that between what we talked about the last couple of weeks and what we'll talk about today, you'll see that those folks, no matter how learned they are, no matter what kind of following they have, they don't do justice to the Word of God. We're going to see that our distinctive testimony does justice to the Word of God. We're going to see that our distinctive testimony is the way that if one interprets the Scripture as it's written, it's going to produce the possibility that that person could enter into the fullness of practice as described in the Word of God. Does that sound like it's something important to you? Amen. Yeah, it is important. And so we're taking some time on this. But I, I'm hoping that uh, in, in taking the time that we have, we'll put an exclamation point at the end of our testimony concerning this experience and its biblical reality, vitality, and, and promise. Because the promise is to all who came after the apostles, even to the end of the age. Uh, let's uh, look at a couple of verses today. Uh, these are going to be new verses uh, from uh, what we've been looking at. The first one is found in the book of Acts chapter 2 this time. Uh, this is found in Acts chapter 2. This is the New International Version of the Bible, verse number 4. It says this, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And then, probably I don't need to read this verse right now, but I'm going to read it just to make sure that I do. Uh, this is found in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And this is verse number 14, again from the New International Version of the Bible. It says this, If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. All right. Praise the name of the Lord. May he add his blessing to the reading of his word. Um, let's just kind of summarize this uh, uh, together as we have been looking at this over several weeks. Um, the, the thing that we've been looking at is what, it, you know, what are the marks of a spirit-filled believer um, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, very strongly, hopefully, so that you can walk away with this and remember it, the marks of a spirit-filled believer, according to the Scripture, are miracles. Right? A person who is not walking in miracles does not show the scriptural evidence of being a spirit-filled believer. I don't care what you can say about how good of a church person a person is. I don't care how... You, uh, how nice and kind you can say a person is, the thing that marks a spirit-filled believer, according to the scripture, is miracles. Miracles. Now, the, the, the miracle of note that we'll be talking about today a lot is speaking in tongues. It's not the only miracle. There are other mir miracles that are associated with being a spirit-filled believer as well. But uh, of all of those things, as we have looked at the text, we see that it seems like at least when a person becomes spirit-filled, it seems to think that it seems to, the first thing that comes out of them in regards to the miraculous is tongues, speaking in other tongues. Now, some folks will say, wait a minute, uh, you know, I, I've been reading in, in Galatians chapter 5, and there it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Again, what you need to understand and remember is that there is a distinction between someone being born again and someone being filled with the Holy Spirit. 
two different and distinct experiences of a believer in the, in the promise of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the person who turns to Christ in faith is born again. God puts the Holy Spirit inside of them, makes them a new creature. Out of that reality comes the fruit. The only reason anyone can produce the fruit of the Spirit is that they've been born again. And so when Galatians chapter 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit, it's talking about those, those evidences, perhaps you could say, those, those outcomings or those outflows of the fact that the Holy Spirit has taken up resident in, residence inside of a person. Is that the same as the marks of a Spirit-filled believer? No, it's not. It's not at all. The fruit of the Spirit is something that is beautiful and remarkable, but it's not something that comes out of an experience of being Spirit-filled um, in terms of the miraculous. Do we, do we get the difference? Now, it is common, and it is, it's a popular thing amongst those who don't understand all of these things that we have been talking about over the couple, past couple of weeks, to in their mind think that the fruit of the Spirit is more important or is a better evidence of a Spirit-filled life than the miraculous. But that is to compare apples and oranges. A person is confusing categories to do that. And I'm telling you, some famous people have done that kind of a thing, and what can I say? They're wrong. They're wrong on the basis of the text in the scripture. They're wrong on the basis of what's there. Um, and the reason that they end up being wrong is because they don't want to accept some of the things that I've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, and it blinds them to what is there in the text. You know, you can go to the text with presuppositions, and when you do, is it any wonder that you end up seeing things differently than what's actually in the text? See, that certainly does happen. So don't confuse the fruit of the Spirit with the marks of being filled with the Spirit. They're not the same. Anyone who is born again should produce the fruit of the Spirit. But anyone who is not filled with the Spirit is not going to produce miracles. You hear me? You say, well, doesn't God do some miracles amongst people that aren't technically filled with the Spirit? He's been known to do that, but it's, but it's not according to the kind of pattern or the kind of expectation, anticipation that we have according to the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, the works that I do, you will do, and even greater works. So what did Jesus give to his disciples? He gave them a promise of expectation and anticipation. I got to tell you, folks that don't understand the difference between being filled with the Holy Spirit and being born of the Holy Spirit, um, they don't produce miracles. They would have to sit in front of the promise of Jesus who said, greater works than, than I do will you do. They would have to hear that promise and say, well, it doesn't really mean that. It actually means something else. It means something less than that. It means something other than that. See what I'm saying? Is if you don't understand the difference and don't embrace this this obvious truth of the scripture, you end up misinterpreting all the other scriptures that talk about the subject matter, and you end up with a, with a, a blighted view of what it means to be a spiritual person, right? You, you need to understand distinction between baptism and the Holy Spirit, distinction with being born again, what is the marks of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or a person who becomes a spirit-filled believer, the marks are the miraculous. I probably have beat that dead horse enough. We all get that now, right? All right, so let's look at the, the text in uh, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse number 4, and see uh, how clearly uh, we can get a, a handle on this. Now, the first thing I want you to know, notice there are the, the verbs in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we have a, a succession. Uh, I'll call them a cascade of verbs. Uh, we'll ha we have a, a succession of verbs that are important. They're important because they are, uh, they are written in different voices. Now, you know, we've talked about voices in, in language before. Uh, some of this stuff sometimes seems tedious when we start talking about linguistic details. But believe it or not, those things are important to interpretation. 
if the if the language is written in certain ways it's meant to convey certain things some of those things are expressed through things like voice now when we talk about voice we are talking about the the perspective of how that that the action uh, of the verb is taking place so that when we talk about something like an active voice what we're saying is the subject did the verb did the action that's the active voice when we talk about the passive voice, what we're saying is that the subject had the action done to them. Right? And so you have something that is, that is different. You, the voice makes the understanding of what's communicated different. You might have the same subject, you might have the same verb, but if it's in active, it means the subject's doing it. If it's in passive, it means the subject is having it done to it. Right? And then there's the middle voice. And the middle voice says that the subject is doing it, but is also being affected by it, right? In the middle of active and, and passive is the middle voice. And the middle voice says that there's something else going on there besides just doing it or having it done to you. There's, there's a place where, where kind of both of those things are in some way true, right? And so you have to understand these conceptions in this concept of voice um, that help you to understand what's being communicated by, you know, by language. Now in Acts chapter 2, um, the thing that you need to understand is just the voices of this succession of verbs. The first verb uh, that we want to talk about is the word fill, active voice. So when it says, and they were filled in the Holy Spirit or filled by the Holy Spirit, the, the thought there is, is that the the uh, uh, the the, uh, uh, the action of the spirit to fill them is is his? It's it's not um, it's not the person being filled. So if we say uh, so and so is filled by the Holy Spirit, and we're speaking it in a passive voice as this is, um, then then that person is not doing the filling, but having the filling done to them. They were filled by the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit. What that is saying is that that was a passive action, that that is something that was totally in God's hands. That was totally in the purview of God. It wasn't them, it, not their action, not their intent, not their energy. It, that's not what caused that to happen. What caused it to happen was God. God filled them with the Holy Spirit. So that's in the passive. And then we get to this little word. Now, it, it, in some English translations, it doesn't come out as, as well as in others. Um, it says, um, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began, that little word began. Believe it or not, that's a verb. <laughs> it means that you start to do something or you start to be, right? That's a verb. That verb there, you know, I said there was these successions of verbs. This verb there is not in the passive, like being filled with. This one's in the middle. And so what it's saying is that those disciples, they were passive in being filled, right? The Holy Spirit was, or God was filling them with the Holy Spirit. They were passing, they were having that done to them. They began, now it switches to the middle voice. And so what it's saying there is that they were active, as well as being affected. They were, they were the recipients of action in some way, some effect in some way, but also they were the doers of action in some way. They began. And so you have this subtle shift in voice. First going from passive, now going to middle. Are you still with me? I don't want to lose anyone in all the detail, but it's important detail. Okay, and then we switch to the, the third verb in this succession, and that is the verb to speak. To speak. Now, this is in the present infinitive active, right? And so we move from them being passive and being filled, then, it's, then we move to the middle in being beginning to do something. And what is it that they're beginning to do? They're beginning to speak. When we get to speak, who is the actor there? It's not in the middle anymore. Now it's in the active. And so the, the action of speaking is on the disciples. It's not something that God was doing. 
And it doesn't even say that it was something that God was in some sense involved with. It's putting it squarely on the disciples. So this experience that they had of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is something that began with God's activity and ends with their activity. This is something that begins with God taking action and ends with them taking action. This is how this thing works. Do you understand the subtleties of that and why it's so important? Um, when folks don't pay attention to that cascade of voices, uh, what they end up having an expectation is that somehow or another what we see written here in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 4 was just so much God's doing that, that the disciples were just, as I've mentioned before, like a log on a stream or a river, just carried along by the action of God. But that's not what the text says. That's not what the detail of grammar in this verse says. It says that they ended up being just as active as God was at the beginning. As God began to fill them, then they began to be inspired by that filling, and then they did something. They acted. I would say they acted in response, but you can see it however you want to see it to tell you the truth, as long as it ends up with the understanding that they weren't made to speak. They did not suddenly become little hand uh, puppets or sock puppets. They did not become someone who was overwhelmed and being carried along by something that was bigger and beyond them. This was something that they did. It was their initiation. It was their energy. It was their action. That's an important concept to remember. God starts it. They finish it, if, if you can put it that way. So in understanding what we're seeing uh, presented there, uh, basically what it comes down to is just this. When a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, God has turned loose something inside of them that ends up requiring their action. Now I said that the mark of a Spirit-filled believer is the miraculous. This is the pattern for every miraculous thing a believer will ever do. When a believer does something miraculous, they are never a sock puppet. They are never forced by, by urges or by power that's above and beyond them, outside of them, to do a thing. Never. That's not a, mor a, a miraculous inspiration according to the testimony of New Testament Scripture. If somebody is moving in something of that nature, I would say that what you have is somebody who is under the influence of a demon. Someone under the influence of something that is, that is not God, and I would call into question whether or not that person is actually born again. If the Holy Spirit makes you do something, then it's not the Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit doesn't make any of us do anything. That's not the way the miraculous works. It's not the way it starts to work in a believer's life. It's not the way it continues to work in a believer's life. What happens when a person moves in the miraculous, this pattern sets it forth, and it's the same for all miraculous movement. God will inspire something that a person picks up on so that they're in it together. Ultimately, the person acting on really what comes down to faith acts on it uh, according to what God has inspired. Right? That's how it all works. So if you're ever going to heal the sick, it'll work by this same pattern. If you're ever going to prophesy, it'll act on this same pattern. If you're ever going to do a work of power, it will act on this same pattern. If you're ever going to do anything that's miraculous, no matter what the description of it is in the Bible, it'll always work on this same pattern. This is the pattern of the miraculous that was first experienced in the initiation experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There it results in the miracle of tongues. Other times, in other places, in a spirit-filled believer's life, that same kind of experience of Holy Spirit inspiration and, and uh, moving will occur according to the same pattern. It'll start off with something that is passive in the sense the Holy Spirit is stirring, the Holy Spirit is moving, the Holy Spirit is filling, and it'll end with the person acting on it. Do you understand what I'm saying? It starts off with the Holy Spirit moving, ends with the person moving. Every single time. 
doesn't matter what the miracle is. So, you know, there's this whole, this whole body of, well, let's just call them ignorant. That, that's a kind word for it. This whole body of ignorant believers in the church body, and we could go back hundreds and hundreds of years and still say the same thing. There's this body of ignorant believers in the church body who think that somehow or another, if the miraculous is going to occur in their life, Thunderbolts are going to have to hit them. Something's going to have to pick them up. You know, they're going to be levitated. They're going to be just pushed out by the by the you know the the rushing wind of the Holy Spirit. It's not true. It's not how it ever happened. It's not how it ever will happen. It's not what God wants you to do. I have taught you so many times through the years. One of the beautiful things that the Book of Genesis teaches us: God's intent in making human beings is not to push us around like we're puppets, nor is it to somehow or another confine us like he's a jailer. You know, you do this at the time I tell you to do it. You'll get up when I tell you to get up. You'll go to bed when I tell you to go to bed. You know, folks have distorted notions of what God's trying to do in making us in the wonderful way that he's made us. Here's the truth. God wants to share life as he knows it with us. We get to be a partner with God. It means we have to trust Him, and it means that we have to take hold of the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and when the Spirit stirs, to go with it, to act on it. Why? Because we're unafraid. We're unafraid of the good thing that God has given us, number one. And number two, I would say, because we are people that understand God's giving us a gift that makes us a partner with Him. We get to be in the family business. When Jesus said, these works, even greater works, will you do because I go to the Father and pour out the Holy Spirit. This is what he's talking about. And so, you know, is this important? It absolutely is. Is Pentecost important? It absolutely is. Because without these understandings that we derive from the scriptures, that we understand from what's there in the text, we end up being people that live at a less level than we're meant to. We live we live in an experience that's less than what we're intended to experience. We live with less power than we're intended to experience. We live with less fruitfulness than we're intended to experience. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I, you know, I'm just, not that it matters, but you know, I'm so tired of Christianity being less than it was intended to be. And I can look in the mirror and say that to myself. I'm so tired of you being less than what you were intended to be. You know, things start to improve when we understand what we're talking about today and last week and the week before that. When we start to understand it and we begin to embrace a faith that can walk in it. Right? Things begin to change. Now, um, what else do we have to learn for <laughs> Verse number 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Are you still with me? Say amen. 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 Verse number 14 says this. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. One of the things that you have to understand, and this is the, 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 like the most detailed of the details that we're going to talk about here today, is that when we talk about this thing, tongues, specifically. Now we talked about the miraculous in general up to this point in time. Now let's talk about tongues specifically. You know, folks have scratched their head and say, well, how does that happen? And one of the biggest problems that we have is not understanding what the scriptures actually teach, again, in the language itself, about the, the technical aspects of what speaking in tongues is. Now this part in, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 14, tells us something important. And that is just this. When a person speaks in tongues, their reason, and that's the word that's used there, it's Greek news, their reason is unfruitful. In other words, their conscious mind, their rational mind is unengaged. It's not their mind that is rationalizing reasoning, acting as kind of a, you know, a, a mediator, or maybe we could say a referee. The active mind is not doing any of those things, but a person is praying out of their spirit being. 
which is not something that the mind necessarily has a, a good level of understanding or control over. Do we get that? Okay, so what that means is just this, that when a lot of people are questioning and wondering what's going on with tongues, they have this notion, and this is the, the, the most ridiculous notion of all, they have this, this idea that somehow or another, the Holy Spirit's going to teach them a new language that they'll be able to speak. That's wrong. That never happened. It didn't happen in Acts chapter 2. never happened ever in the church that ever spoke in tongues. Every person who's ever spoken in tongues doesn't know what they're saying. Every person who's ever spoken in tongues has not known the language that they're speaking. Everyone who has ever spoken in tongues has not understood what it is that they're trying to say. Their rational mind is unfruitful. What is fruitful is their spirit. That, that spiritual part of your being, the Holy Spirit's dwelling in, that brings you into new life in Christ, that spiritual being that is filled with the Holy Spirit when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, that aspect of your being is what is moving and fueling that. It's not a person speaking from their mind, it's a person speaking from their spirit. And so, you know, when it comes to understanding tongues and maybe some of the things that people are afraid of it or some of the things that might hinder somebody from just go ahead and entering into this miraculous initiator uh, of things uh, in a, in a spirit-filled life, uh, one of the things you need to understand is that, that uh, your mind is not going to be able to understand it. Right? And, and that's important because, you know, for everyone who speaks in tongues, what, if they hear themselves, guess what they think? I'm speaking gobbledygook. You know why they think that? Because in their own mind, they are speaking gobbledygook. The, the mind, the noose, the rational self is unfruitful. It's not engaged. It doesn't understand. It's not where things are coming from. Things are coming from something other than that. Right? Um, a person who is speaking in tongues is a person who doesn't even know what they're saying. They don't know what's coming out of them. You know, if they're going to do something like that, why would they do that? Well, number one, they know the Spirit's stirring them. Number two, they have faith in the promise and the pattern of Scripture. Right? No, number one, number one, the Spirit is stirring them. Number two, they trust the promise, they trust the testimony of Scripture. That, that it's, it's really, as I said earlier, right, it really does come down to a question of faith. If you can't believe what's in the Word, will you, will you begin to be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak with tongues? No, you won't. If you can't believe the Word, will you stretch out and, and begin doing those miraculous works that Jesus promised? Not only His works, but greater than these. Will you do those things? No. Everything in the Bible, everything that's promised to us requires faith. We have to trust, we have to believe, we have to stretch out in the faith that we have. And if we don't, then we won't. And, you know, that's, that's the way the church was for, like, you know, almost 2,000 years. They wouldn't, and so they didn't. <laughs> faith does. Faith is willing. Faith is willing to jump when it doesn't know what the landing spot is. And if you don't have faith, will you move in miracles? No, you won't. And then we go back to uh, just a little bit of, of uh, more detail out of Acts chapter 2, verse number 4. It just, when it talks in that second phrase, and I guess maybe I should read that to you again, just so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Are you still with me? Say amen. amen. Hopefully this is the clearest thing you've ever heard in your entire life on speaking in tongues. Right? If so, then I've done my job. Uh, this is what it says there. And, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, you know, if you look at that in King James, it says that they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Uh, you know, either way you look at that, what's important? Well, you know, we, get into, we get into voices and, t and tenses again. Um, this word, give, it's, it's in an imperfect tense. And so... Uh, it, and it's also in, in an infinitive. So it's in an imperfect tense, and the thing to know about that is just this, is that what it is saying is that this is something that is not finished. This is not, this is not something that was done in, in the past. 
when the scriptures talk about something in a, in a tense that's finished, you know, you're saying that the action was done in the past. But when you put it in the imperfect, what you're saying is the action is ongoing. It, it's, it's not done happening. And so when it says that, that they, were, they were speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave them, and this gave is in imperfect, what it means is that the way that this works is that as the Spirit is giving, the person is speaking. You see that? There's not a lag time there. Again, we have these notions, and these notions sometimes keep us from entering into the miraculous. But one of the notions that we have is that that we'll like, you know, we'll get a certain, a, a, you know, a certain supply. We're like a dam on on a on a river. A certain amount of water will come in. We'll hold on to it, and when it gets enough, then we'll release it. No, that's not what's that's not what that's not what's said in the text. What's said in the text is, as the Spirit was giving. They were speaking. Do you understand why that's important? As the Spirit was giving, they were speaking. Why is your mind unengaged? Why is your mind unfruitful? Well, because the process of, of a person entering in the miraculous, and particularly in speaking in tongues, is one that is in real time. As it's coming in, it's going out. There's not, a, there's not an opportunity for you to sit there and think about it, critique it, you know, edit it, try to fix it up. <laughs> As it's coming in, it's going out. That's super important. Someone say amen. Amen. It's super important. Why? Well, again, it just addresses some of these, these, these misunderstandings that folks have about the miraculous and about the, uh, uh, excuse me, getting filled with the Holy Spirit and about speaking in tongues. People have notions and understandings that are in error that don't match with what the Word says and because they don't agree with what the Word says those people end up never experiencing anything. They're expecting the wrong thing. They're anticipating the wrong thing. They think it works some other way than what the text actually says that it works. But when you understand these things and you have the faith to reach out and take hold of the promise of God, guess what happens? It's not like John MacArthur and all of his ilk, and I want to say that in a negative tone. Can I, can I make you understand that? If you like John MacArthur, there's worse things that you could do, but there's a whole lot of better things that you could do. Right? There's just a, there's just a, whole, a whole host of naysayers and people that are pharisaical, that are doing their utmost to keep God's people from experiencing the things that God has promised. They won't enter in themselves, and they keep God's people from entering in. That's a Pharisee. That's what Jesus said about them. Amen. Right? John MacArthur is a Pharisee. Justin Peterson is a Pharisee. They, they don't deserve to get second notice from anyone who's serious about the Word of God or about following after the things of God. Now, if I stepped on your toes, please forgive me. Sometimes, you know, just, you've got to let it out there. You know, <laughs> as an old preacher once said, well, let the chips fall where they may. If one of those chips goes and hits grandma and kills, kills her. We'll give her a decent burial and we'll keep on preaching the truth. <laughs> it's very important for us to understand what the scriptures actually say about these, this subject matter. Because it's there in such clarity. There's not a reason for us to have mistaken notions about it. It's there in such clarity that there's no reason for us to have mistaken notions about how it works. There's no reason for us to have mistaken notions about how we get engaged with it, or how we get involved with it, or what part we play in it. There's no reason for that at all. If you believe in the promise of the Holy Spirit being given to you in fullness, just like Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 when we were looking at that, if you believe that, by faith embrace it. Remember we talked about this? Faith is, is, is something that takes hold of and takes it for himself. If you believe the promise, take it for yourself and then move in whatever the Spirit is stirring. Move in it. Be bold, be brave, be courageous, be New Testament. 
Because if you don't want to do any of those things, what you'll end up experiencing is the same dead Christianity that was around from 250 A.D. to 1900. Not that there weren't some serious believers in that time, there was. But look at the testimony of the church overall. Deadness. For hundreds of years. Because people didn't take the word seriously. Because people did not pay attention to the detail that's clearly written in the word. And because people didn't have the faith to reach out, take hold of it, and walk in it. I hope that we're not that kind of people.